Welcome to the judge orientation for Logos Forensics Association speech and debate. Our objective here is to give you some pointers to help you be a better judge for a competitive debate activity. And before I go into the details, there's four key overviews that I want to make sure everybody gets. Really, this is all you have to have to be a good judge. Number one, recognize that this activity would not exist if we didn't have judges. We need you to make this happen. Oftentimes, parents or adults or people in the community feel like they're not qualified to judge. And my question is this, if you're qualified to vote in the real world, you're certainly qualified to judge a high school debate round. So we need you, this activity cannot happen without you, most important thing to remember. Number two thing to remember is we want you to leave your biases behind. We all have certain biases in the world. We have opinions on events, we have opinions on politics, we have opinions on policy. Keep in mind that our students are here and they're competing and they did not choose which side of the resolution they're debating on. So we don't want you punishing a student who's taking a side that you may not agree with. So keep in mind, leave your biases at the side, uh, aside. Try not to let those influence your decision in the debate round. Number three, keep in mind that we are not really enacting policy. These students are gonna be debating a resolution with policy changes, but the nice thing is that the vote you make in this debate round will not affect the real world from a policy perspective. What we're here to do is not to reward the best policy, the best government proposal. Really in this debate round, we are here to reward skill sets. Your job is to reward students who've done research, students who know logic, students who communicate their ideas better. We're here to reward those skill sets, not to enact policy. I'm a person who has strong opinions about real world politics and events. And yet when I judge, I vote against my personal opinion frequently, uh, maybe even the majority of the time, I am voting against my personal opinion. <clears throat> That's fine. I sleep fine. I don't lose any sleep over it because I know we're rewarding skill sets, not enacting policy. And the fourth thing I think you need to remember here in this activity is that the judge is always right. Uh, we get all hung up in the, the details of debate, and I'll give some of those details to you in a bit. But the bottom line is the judge is always right. If you're making a decision, uh, your decision is the correct one. If a student has the round winning argument, but they do not communicate it to you well, they don't communicate it so that you understand it, that is their failure. It is their job to communicate their winning argument to you so that you understand it. If they have the winning argument and they don't communicate it so that you understand it, they deserve to lose. So really use your common sense Listen attentively, but know that whatever decision you make is going to be the right decision in this round. Let's talk a little bit about how speech and debate works. So we have a resolution that we are going to debate in the debate year. The resolution is always a broad scope, a broad area. And within that resolution, the students will choose subparts or sub areas that that resolution to debate. Now, all team policy debate resolutions call for change. Uh, this year's resolution is no exception. So we're gonna have two teams in the debate round. We have an affirmative team and we have a negative team. The affirmative team has to affirm the resolution. So they'll be calling for a change to the political system or status quo. The negative team negates the resolution and they will be usually defending the status quo or certainly arguing that the affirmative team's proposal is not a good proposal. So an affirmative team and a negative team. Now there's a couple terms that you really need to know. Uh, the first term is the word plan. The plan in a debate round is the proposal of the affirmative team. So the plan is the specific legislative proposal that the affirmative team is giving you. So the plan would be like the bill in Congress. The plan is what we're gonna change about the status quo. The other term I want to give you is the term case, C-A-S-E. And if plan is the change that's being proposed, the case is the reason for that change. So case would be reasons why we should adopt the plan. So we have in the debate round plan and case, the affirmative will advocate for a plan of change and they will make a case for that in terms of reasons. And we encourage our debaters to use outline structure. It helps keep track of arguments. So they may have harms uh, that are really the case. And they may have a case, they say harm one, here's something that's wrong. That's why we need our plan. 
They may say harm too. Something else is wrong. Here's why we need our plan. Or instead of harms, their case might be outlined and numbered as advantages. They may say advantage one to our plan is such and such. Advantage two. So whether or not the affirmative team claims harms or advantages or observations or contentions, what they call them doesn't matter. They are reasons for change. So keep in mind the case is the reason for change. And the plan is the change. Now, you can judge the debate round any way you like, but there's a tried and true method of judging debate rounds uh, called the stock issues approach or the stock issues paradigm. And what the stock issues approach does, it gives you tools to help you judge the debate round. So allow me to introduce to you four stock issues. These are four ways to evaluate all the arguments that happen in a debate round. The first stock issue is called topicality. And each stock issue asks a question. So topicality asks the question, it asks, is the plan of the affirmative within the scope of the resolution? So if we had a resolution on energy policy and the affirmative team's plan was to build butterfly sanctuaries, uh, that may not be within the energy policy resolution. And so if that plan is outside the resolution, the negative would probably argue topicality. They're saying, judge, that plan is not topical. And if the negative debates better and convinces you that the plan is not topical, you could vote negative on topicality. So topicality as a stock issue helps make sure that the debate is in an area where the students have prepared, helps make sure that it's on topic. And topicality looks at the plan. So we don't say that the case has to be topical. Uh, the reasons for change don't have to be topical. It is the change itself that must be topical. The second stock issue we call significance. And just like topicality asks an issue, it asks is the plan within the scope of the resolution, significance asks a question as well. Significance asks, is there a significant reason for change? For example, an affirmative team that says the reason for our plan is the federal government will save $1,000 a year. Well, that's not a very significant reason to change the whole structure of American politics or American government. So the affirmative would have a burden to show that there is a significant reason for change. And given the stock issue of significance, it's not the plan that we evaluate on significance, it is the case. So we would say that the case needs to be significant. And the negative is going to argue, uh, perhaps, that the reasons for change are not significant. Now the question you might be asking, how big does the number have to be? How big does the problem have to be to be significant? I have an easy answer. The answer is it's debatable. Not only will the students debate about how big the numbers are, how important the problem is, how good the solution is, but they will hopefully be telling you why a particular number is or is not significant. And the affirmative may give you reasons why this problem is significant. The negative might give you reasons why it's not. And the issue of significance is debatable, up and down, inside out, backwards and forwards. The next stock issue is called solvency. And solvency also asks a question. The question asked in solvency is, will the plan of the affirmative solve the problems that they cite in the case? Or will the plan bring about the advantages that they cite in the case? So the question of solvency is really, will the plan work? Will it solve? Uh, so we ask the question, will the plan work? Uh, by the way, this is a real world question. All of these are. In the real world, if you were a congressman or a senator, you would probably, at least hopefully, not vote for a bill that claims that there's a problem but doesn't solve the problem. Uh, if the bill is not going to work, you probably would not vote for it. And so solvency, although it kind of looks at the case and the plan, it really is a question of the plan. Will the plan work? The fourth stock issue is called inherency. And don't confuse this with the word inerrant as being without error. That is a different word. <clears throat> this is inherent as being a integral part of something. 
And the stock issue of inherency is really a defense mechanism for the negative team to defend the status quo. Keep in mind, I said earlier, that the affirmative team normally is trying to change the status quo, and the negative team is normally trying to preserve the status quo. Well, the negative may use inherency as a way of defending the status quo. For example, if the affirmative cites a particular set of problems, maybe the affirmative says unemployment is too high, therefore you need our plan, the negative might argue, oh no, unemployment is not that high and it's coming down. The status quo is fixing it. <clears throat> that would be an inherency argument. So when the negative argues that the status quo is fixing the problem, that is an inherency argument. And there may be a lot of different ways and strategies that the negative team would do that. Uh, they could say the status quo is fixing the problem because some government policy already in effect is fixing it. Or the negative might say the status quo is fixing the problem just because the business cycle is changing or um, you know, things are changing in our society. So in that regard, inherency would be a case argument because we're arguing the status quo is fixing the problem, therefore we don't need the plan. There is, however, a plan version of inherency. Sometimes the negative may get wind that Congress is about to pass the affirmative team's plan. And if the negative convinces you that the affirmative team's proposal already has passed or is highly likely to pass, then there'd be no reason for you to vote for the affirmative team because the status quo is doing it. So there's another inherency approach saying the status quo is going to give you this plan uh, even without the affirmative team. So inherency could be either a plan um, side argument or a case argument. But I want you to understand plan and case. They're integral to understanding debate. Plan is the change, case is the reason for change, and the four stock issues divide up the way I've put on the grid here. Now we hold the affirmative team to a pretty high burden in a debate round. Of all the possible plans that they could enact under the resolution, they get to choose their plan. They get to choose their reasons for change. So the affirmative has a lot of advantages. But the negative has advantages because the negative only has to win one stock issue. So the negative could lose significant solvency inherency, but if they win topicality, you would vote negative. Or if maybe affirmative wins everything, but the negative wins solvency, you would vote negative on solvency. So the negative really only has to win one stock issue to win the debate round. We hold the affirmative to a higher burden. And so that does make it harder for the affirmative, but the affirmative will probably have more evidence. They've had more time to prepare. So on balance, it ends up being a pretty fair competition. Now, you may ask yourself on solvency, uh, no affirmative is going to solve 100% of any problem. Uh, if affirmative has a plan or a bill to deal with crime, uh, maybe that only fixes 20% of crime. And the negative may say, judge, they don't solve all of crime. Well, that may be fine. I don't think in the real world we would say that a crime bill has to solve all of crime. If you were convinced that a particular crime bill would reduce crime by 20%, we'd probably vote for it. So we don't demand an affirmative to have 100% solvency. Now the question is, how much solvency does the affirmative team need to have? Well, the answer is a significant amount. And now we're back to the significance debate. So four stock issues, affirmative should win <coughs> all four. Negative can choose to argue one, two, three, or all four of these. Now the debaters may not always use these terms, but good debaters, more experienced, experienced debaters will use these terms. Now you may ask the question, okay, the affirmative team won all four stock issues, do they win the debate round? Not yet. There's one more test that we're going to have for the affirmative team to see if they're gonna win the debate round. If the affirmative wins, when I judge, I look at the stock issues, and if the affirmative survives the negative's attack on the stock issues, now I give one more test. And this test has different names. Um, it's sometimes called net benefits. or sometimes it may just be called desirability of the plan. But what I do is at the end of the round, I look at all the benefits of the affirmative team's plan and I put them on one side of a balance scale. Some of you may have had those balance scales in physics or chemistry where you put little one gram measurements on one side and you put them out of sulfur on the other side. And it's just a double arm balance scale. That's the way scales were in the, the old ancient world. Well, I do this, I create in my mind this little balance scale. And I put all the benefits 
of the affirmative or affirmative plan on one side of the scale. And if the affirmative has some benefits, it will tip the scale. Uh, now, the negative, however, might present another category of argument. This category of argument is called disadvantages. Disadvantages are bad things that happen if we adopt this plan. And by the way, debaters may call disadvantages by abbreviations. They may call them disads or they may call them DAs, but they're disadvantages. And as I put the DAs on the other side of the balance scale, the scale may tip the other way. And as the round is over and I'm back in the judge room evaluating the judge or wherever I am doing it, uh, I'm looking at the benefits and the detriments of the plan. And whichever way the scale tips, that is the way I'm going to vote. But keep in mind, I don't get my balance scale out until I've evaluated the stock issues. It's entirely possible that a non-topical plan might have more benefits than disadvantages. But if the negative successfully argues that it's non-topical, uh, I'm not going to vote for that plan because it's non-topical. So you want to do a little check of the stock issues first. And that may cause you to vote negative before you even bother to get out your balance scale. But if the affirmative looks like they survive and they're going to win the stock issues, then we get the balance scale and I vote whichever way the balance scale goes. Now keep in mind, as a judge, you want to judge the round based on the arguments the debaters make. Don't judge the round based on the arguments in your head. Oftentimes you'll be judging and you'll know, maybe as an adult or in the real world experience, you have more experience than these kids, you know of an argument that should win the round. But don't vote on that argument unless one of the debate teams makes the argument. Because we don't want to give a debater or a team a win for an argument they didn't make. So don't let someone win because of an argument that's in your head. <clears throat> Base the round on the arguments that the students make. So that's kind of a big overview. You've got your stock issues, <clears throat> you have the disadvantage, uh, and at the end, you're going to evaluate the issues and decide who did the better job of debating. And so you really are measuring the arguments, but you're also looking at the skill sets. Who had the better evidence? Who had the better arguments? Who had the better support? Uh, if a team drops arguments, you know, that may uh, work against them, especially if the arguments that they drop uh, are good arguments. So you want to pay attention to that. Now, there is a system of note-taking called flowing. And flowing is simply the judge's own scorecard or note, note sheet for the debate round. Uh, you will have a ballot that you'll fill out. The ballot will be where you award points to the students, you decide the win-loss, and you make comments. The ballot is what the students will see. Your flow pad or your flow sheet are your own notes just for your purposes. And so I would encourage you to take your own notes, try to keep track of the arguments, and that will be a good tool for you, and you don't have to turn that in. At the bottom of the day, at the end of the debate round, what really matters is that ballot. And keep in mind that your ballot has points on it. But let's talk about the ballot. The ballot is what you're going to fill out as a judge to indicate who wins the round and also to give feedback to the students. Now, the most important part of the ballot is you're going to award a win or a loss to each team. I would recommend you use the stock issues and the net benefits analysis that we just talked about to decide whether to vote for the affirmative team or the negative team. Uh, <clears throat> keep in mind, you don't have to agree with their position. Who did the better job of debating? That is the key. So that's the first thing you want to do. Now on your ballot, there's a place for each debater. You'll see a grid with four squares near the top of the ballot. There is a square for each of the four competitors in the round. <clears throat> there's a box for comments. For competitor A, the first affirmative, you'll write comments for that student in their box. But you'll notice at the top of the box is a place to award points. And you'll award those points, but I would not have you give the win and loss based on the points. It is entirely possible that the debater and the team with the most points may not win the round. So points are an additional way of scoring the students. Uh, they do count some for trophies and so forth, but the points do not have to align with the win loss. Use the stock issues and this net benefits analysis that I gave you to decide who wins and loses. So I would do that first. And then after you've decided that, now we need to fill in the points. Now you're also, in addition to giving points in six different categories for each speaker, there's also a place to rank the debaters. You'll rank which was the first or best debater, the second best, third best, and fourth best. How do you like the way I say that? Fourth best. 
Uh, what I do as a judge to make my life easier, when I've decided my win-loss and I've given the win to the affirmative or the negative and I've circled that, that win or checkmarked that win, now I'm going to evaluate in my mind who was the best debater in the round. And I'm going to circle one. Their, their rank was number one. They're the best debater. And I look and see who's the second best. I circle them for two, third, circle three, and fourth, circle four. Now that I've done that, I've given the win-loss, and I've determined my first, second, third, fourth debaters, now I'm going to award the points. So now I go to my first debater and I look at each of the categories, and I look at refutation and analysis and cross-examination, and there's a one through five ranking for each of those categories. One would be poor, five would be excellent. And so I look at that and say, wow, how was debater one, how was their cross-examination? Both when they were doing the cross-examination and when they were being cross-examined. And I say, boy, that student was really above average. I may circle the four and give them four points of cross-examination. <clears throat> then I look at their persuasion. How were they? And I circle a score one through five. And when they're all done, I've circled one through five in six categories. So a perfect score, which I hardly ever give, would be a total of 30 points, six categories times five. And there's a place to total up the points, and maybe my student this round got 26 points. So my best debater gets 26 points. Now I go to my second best debater, I'm gonna rank them on those same scales. But I'm gonna have an eye to make sure that my number two debater doesn't get more points than the number one debater. <clears throat> As I'm going through, I'm doing the math in my head, because some of these point categories are a little bit nebulous. You know, persuasion, delivery, you know, some of those things you can adjust a little bit if you need to to get the final outcome. So I'm going to award, maybe my second debater, instead of getting 28 points, gets 27 points. I go to the third debater. Man, the third debater is about the same skill level as the second debater. So they might have 26 points as well. You might have a tie in points, that's fine. You just have to make sure that a debater with higher points never gets a lower ranking in the room. And I'll give points to my second debater, my third debater, my fourth debater. And that seems to be a good way to get the outcome that you want. It also makes your life easier as a judge. Uh, because oftentimes, if you just award points before you rank them, uh, your points may add up, and the debater gets the most points may not be the one you thought was the best debater. And now you're going back, you're changing, and you're racing or trying to change the, the circles. So the process of judging, I would say, is decide the win-loss, which team is going to win, which will lose. Decide my debaters first through fourth, and then award points. Now the other part of the ballot are simply comments. You can be writing comments in the ballot or typing comments in the ballot all during the debate round, but you'll have time when the round is over to add comments. And here's what I call the brain dump. This is when the debaters want your feedback. Tell them what you thought of each individual argument, or at least the arguments you remember. Give them suggestions for how they could have debated better. Uh, did they speak too fast? Were they too soft? Were they too loud? Uh, how is their reasoning? Uh, Cross-examination, were they kind enough to their opponent? Um, you can evaluate individual arguments and say, wow, I like this argument, it was logical, made sense. Or you can comment on a different argument and say, this argument wasn't logical and it didn't have evidence, so it didn't carry much weight. The debaters want to know why you voted the way you did. So in addition to suggestions, there's a part in the ballot which is the reason for decision. And you want to write there why you voted the way you did. You know, which arguments you liked, which arguments you didn't like, was topicality argued, who won the topicality debate. These are all things that you need to um, put on the ballot because the students get frustrated if they lose the debate round and they don't have a reason why. Uh, the thing students dislike the most is the reason for decision if a judge says, I think the negative team did a better job of debating. Well, I guess that's obvious by the fact you voted for the negative, but they would like more specifics than that. And you can fill the front of the ballot. You can also, uh, if it's a paper ballot, you can write on the back. Uh, if it's electronic ballot, there's room to add almost as many comments as you would as you would like. So the ballot is important. I think in conclusion, what I would tell you is that judging is uh, about a third science and about two thirds art. Uh, there are not wrong decisions. So remember the four points I started off with. Number one, we need judges. Don't be gun shy about judging. This activity cannot happen without them. These kids need these skills and they need judges to acquire them. Number two, leave your biases behind. Uh, judge the round on the arguments that are made, not on the arguments in your head. Number three, remember you're not creating policy. You are rewarding skill sets. And then number four, the judge is always right. Your decision is right. Even if two of the people make a different decision, 
This is a communication activity. It is real world. And our students, when they're adults, may be making a presentation to a city council meeting or to a church body or maybe even to the U.S. Congress. And guess what? Everyone who hears their message is not going to agree with them. And they might persuade some members of the audience and not others. The same is true in a debate round. They might persuade you in this round when maybe they would not have persuaded me in the same debate round. This is the human aspect of communication. It is imperfect, but it is real world. Thank you for judging. We appreciate your investment of time. Uh, give these kids good feedback. Just tell them what you think. And that's all we have to do. Thank you.